No, you hang up. No, you. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Love you too. Bye-bye. Sorry, that was my doctor. My lobotomy appointment has been scheduled for Tuesday. Yippee. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to The Internet Report, news that doesn't matter and that you probably shouldn't care about. Here on The Internet Report, I risk my sanity and dignity to spelunk through the anal fissures of the internet, bringing you the highlights of the past month so you can preserve your will to live. First up, a spelling-related spat with a customer left this tattoo artist in tears, but her client's response turned TikTok against her. I had a really bad morning. And then I pull up to the fucking shop and there's somebody sitting here waiting for me. And they fucking had a cover up that was like their boyfriend's name instead of a heart that I gave them. And it fucking blocked it out. I still don't understand how in the year of our geriatric president 2024 people are still getting the names of their girlfriends and boyfriends tattooed on them. Also, that's gotta suck to black out a tattoo that you did. That's like Pope Julius II rolling up on Michelangelo when he's doing the last finishing touches on Adam's dingling for the Sistine Chapel and being like, hey, this is crazy, but we were kind of thinking maybe we should do an eggshell white instead. And then she's like, hey, while we're here, can I get some love conquers all with a line through it? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And, if, and I'm sitting right next to her typing on the fucking iPad and the spell correct draws, does a fucking word for me and I put it through and I look at it and she looks at it and I'm like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? She pays and like goes to leave and she's looking at the picture and she's like, you fucking spelled it wrong. And I'm like, dude, what do you mean? It was spell checked. We both looked at it. We both looked at it. The tattoo artist stresses that both she and the client looked over the stencil multiple times, which led to a heated debate in the comments section. Is a misspelled tattoo the client's fault? or the artist. Many viewers were of the opinion that it's completely the client's fault, that the tattoo artist is paid to tattoo, not to spell, but that's kind of like saying a chef isn't responsible for making sure their ingredients aren't expired just to cook. It's rotten! The client is getting ready to be stabbed repeatedly by a stranger, so I don't think it's super fair to expect them to win any spelling bees in that state of mind. The artist should accept some degree of responsibility, especially if they've done this multiple times. I hate when they do this. It's only happened a couple times. Uh, interesting use of the word only. The artist, who goes by at Spriggs on TikTok, says that she fixed the tattoo the best she could, but that the client verbally abused her for the mistake. She f***ing is pissed and she's calling me a dumb bitch and like... <laughs> I'm sorry. Later on, she posted what the misspelled tattoo looked like and, um, she spelled conquer C-O-N-C-O-U-R, which turns out is an actual word with French origin meaning a public contest or competition. But this is where things get interesting because after her post had received millions of views and tons of support, the client made a video of her own. So I was trying to handle this off of social media, but when I text this girl to confront her about lying in this video, she blocked me. And I just wanted to address a few things, so. The client, who goes by Lie Lie on TikTok, claimed that Spriggs had Lie lied about her reaction and then showed the tattoo that had been fixed. I was gonna go back to her so she could finish fixing it. This is how it looks. Dear heavenly god, was that tattoo done with a screwdriver? She says that she never cussed the artist out or insulted her, but that instead, Spriggs had seen a message on her phone. I did not insult her. I didn't say anything to her. Yeah, it was said, just not to her. It was on my phone. I was texting my cousin. This the text that she talking about. Spriggs made another post, insisting that Lilai had typed out the insulting message purposefully to show her. I didn't ever say, um, you dumb bitch. She f***ing texted it and then showed me her phone. And had refused to cooperate with her when she tried to handle the situation offline. The artist has completely privated her account, and from the evidence both parties showed, I don't think either of them is completely innocent. Spriggs completely butchered her client's arm with an ugly, misspelled tattoo and went crying to TikTok instead of being a professional. Lilai could have waited to sh 
talk to her cousin until after she left the shop. But I don't know. What do you think? Hurry, because the internet's going to stop caring about this and move on in three, two, one. But before we continue, I'd like to take a second to talk about today's sponsor, Opera. The Opera desktop browser is packed with unique features that offer a faster, safer, and smarter browsing experience. When doing research for a video, it only takes a few seconds before I'm buried in tabs. Where's that script I was working on? Did I accidentally close that peer-reviewed article on infant ocular development? What happened to that TMZ clip of a man robbing a target? But the Opera tab islands feature keeps related tabs together in collapsible groups so that I can stay on track as I click on link after link after link. My brain needs constant entertainment to function. And Opera lets me detach my niche four hour long YouTube video essays playing at two times speed into a floating window. So no matter where I navigate on my computer, I can keep watching. Opera allows me to separate my browsing into different workspaces so I can switch between environments depending on whether I'm working or just scrolling for fun with just one click. There are so many other useful features like toggleable VPN and ad blocker, as well as a sidebar to play music and message friends. If you want to check out these tools and more, click the link in my description to try the Opera desktop browser for yourself. When TikToker Demi Skipper gave a house to a young woman in need, she thought she had really made a difference with her platform, especially in light of the affordable housing crisis that has persisted across the United States. But less than two years later, that act of kindness would be turned against her. I'm like actually so sad for her, but like so sad for the house and the journey and like. Demi is the creator of the Trade Me Project, where she challenged herself to start with a bobby pin and trade items with people until she worked her way up to a house. She finally succeeded at the end of 2021, but instead of keeping it for herself, she decided to give it away fully renovated and furnished. She asked viewers to send in their stories and nominate families who needed housing. So today I'm announcing that I'm officially trading this house for a bobby pin. I read over 2,000 emails from everyone who wanted to trade for the Trade Me Project house. One email really stood out to me. Unfortunately, she selected an 18-year-old named named Shay and traveled all the way to Pennsylvania to tell her the news in person. And I'm here to tell you that the house is yours. There is no way. Yes. So unreal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> A whole house. <laughs> and like no rent, no mortgage. No, nothing. Shay gave her the bobby pin and Demi handed over the keys in a heartwarming giveaway that allowed the Trade Me project to start all over again. Shay was lavished with gifts purchased by viewers from Amazon along with a check for $10,000 to start her new life. Yay, I feel so warm and fuzzy inside. I'm gonna add this to my list of hope poor videos that I watch whenever I start daydreaming about a meteorite causing another extinction event. Gee, I sure hope nothing bad happened that would like totally totally ruin this perfect little story. Last week, Shay decided to post this on her TikTok account, captioned, when I literally won a house from a TikToker, but then was later banned from the property. In the comment section, she accused Demi of refusing to transfer the deed, withholding her packages, and even stealing her personal belongings. Of course, people were immediately outraged by this and swarmed the Trade Me Project TikTok page like piranhas to bash Demi for kicking the girl out. And that's when Demi started handing out receipts like a cash register. I got this strange message from somebody that lived next door saying that there were tons of packages outside in the rain. All of the gifts people had bought for Shay had been piling in front of the front door for days because she had gone back to Pennsylvania, leaving Demi scrambling to find someone to hold the packages until she decided to return. On September 27th, it had been almost two months of storing Shay's packages with no sense that she would return, so we decided, Natasha and I, to donate all of the packages to Goodwill. Demi kept in close contact with Shay for the next year, constantly checking to make sure she was okay, with Shay continuing to make excuses, insisting that she would move back in eventually. After the house had been standing empty for 14 months, Demi finally went to see the property. We got to the house and the house was completely ruined. Everything inside, but essentially there was pee on the ground, all of the garbage that had been used in the month that she was there, 
uh, was jammed into closets. So you can imagine what it looks like after 14 months. I've never seen anything like this. I cried in the front yard of the house. Shay had left the house completely trashed and infested with maggots. But instead of juicing this disaster for content the way a filthy, unscrupulous pseudo-journalist like me would have done, Demi decided to stay quiet to protect her until Shay attacked her online and forced her to set the record straight. So after I got home, I thought about posting the video and the content of the house being destroyed, but I decided it wasn't worth it from a human perspective. And in some ways I still wanted to try to protect her. Like, it's really sad now that it's come to this. Demi is way nicer than me. Uh, I hope that every roof over Shay's head for the rest of her life is rented. Shay immediately deleted all of her social media to dodge the self-inflicted backlash, but there are still many people oozing with sympathy for her, excusing her behavior because of difficult life circumstances and possible mental health issues. While I completely agree that these factors could explain someone's inability to live independently or take care of themselves, I don't think it excuses lying and trying to ruin the reputation of someone who literally gave you a place to live for free. There are millions of people who will never have a home and would kill to have the opportunity Shay literally left rotting. Could we get a rain check on that meteorite? Maybe? Hello. This is the last TikTok that I'm going to be making while well, I'm still in the community. Sarah Joy was a popular TikTok creator who centered her content around her experiences as a plain person, an umbrella term used to refer to Amish and Mennonite communities. These communities stress the importance of simple living, many of them completely rejecting technology altogether. Sarah claimed that her phone and entire online presence had to be kept a secret, tugging on viewers' heartstrings by talking about how much she wished for a normal life, to wear baggy sweatshirts and go to college like other girls. Then on March 26th, she suddenly announced that she would be quitting TikTok for good. It has been very nice to get to know all of you, and I appreciate the opportunity that you have given me to talk about the community. I wish you all well. Of course, her audience immediately panicked, calling for welfare checks and trying to get in contact with friends and family. And that's when someone who knew Sarah revealed the truth. If you're Amish, then I'm Amish because I know you. I know this girl and she is lying to every single one of you here on TikTok. They're so scared that the community found out that she has a TikTok when there is no community. Your precious, sweet Amish girl is wearing makeup. Sarah Krispy Kreme. Don't know who this girl is, but as you can see, she's not Amish or Mennonite. But Sarah must have been sneaking peeks at that contraband phone in between churning butter and sewing because the moment people started questioning her legitimacy, she posted a response. It was brought to my attention that someone is on here that I knew their sibling. I did not even really know them. Who's spreading nasty, hateful rumors about me. She then insisted that she had converted and joined the community in 2018, even though this directly contradicted many of her previous posts. The last time I saw her, it was maybe 2018, 2019, before COVID, and I kid you not, I had already become a part of the community. We stood there at a wedding and had a conversation on why I wore this and why I was wearing a certain kind of clothing. I converted. I was not born into it. This response video satisfied her viewers for a while, but then someone stumbled across an old account under the username at antagonize the patriarchy that was posting as recently as december 2022 now miss sarah joy i don't believe that pastor jebediah would approve of the cut of that dress <laughs> at this point sarah joy has deleted her account and i don't believe we will be seeing her or that little bonnet anytime soon. Cosplaying the very real abuse that happens within these isolated conservative communities for pity and attention online is a pretty insane thing to do, but it goes to show just how easy it is to just get on the internet and lie. In fact, I'm not even here right now. Oh, God damn it! 
Now it's time to announce the Internet Idiot Award, a segment for internet activity so unbelievably unintelligent that the culprit must be ceremoniously recognized. And today's winner of the Internet Idiot Award is... Everyone who has harassed actress Avantika Vandenapu for being fan-casted in a non-existent Rapunzel film. <sighs> Apparently, some confused crack- I'm being told I can't say that word. Okay, uh, some hateful honk- no, not that one. It, okay, uh, some perturbed pecker and our PR manager just submitted their two-week notice. Apparently, a bunch of white people thought that an Indian woman was being casted as Rapunzel based on a completely unsubstantiated rumor. And they had a very normal reaction. are trying to squeeze out a tiny racist tear. The average person probably doesn't care whether the hypothetical star of Disney's next lazy, soulless, live-action cash grab is Indian or white. But for the conservative culture warrior, this is a battleground already soaked with the blood of an innocent ginger mermaid. How would you feel if we made Tiana white? What if we made Esmeralda white? They cry through gnashing teeth. And they are absolutely right. The narrative featuring a black woman in Louisiana in the 1920s who faces racial discrimination and class inequality that prevents her from securing a loan for her business would be completely unaffected by a white protagonist. Famously, Esmeralda being a Romani woman had no no effect on the plot of The Hunchback of Notre Dame whatsoever. A film set in France in the 1400s. Definitely don't check any history textbook to check. What a totally reasonable comparison. Rapunzel being German obviously had a huge impact on the story. Remember that iconic scene where she serves Flynn Rider Kartoffel Puffer and then they go get wasted at Oktoberfest? Yeah, what would an Indian woman know about having long hair? Get Ashley on the phone. We have an Aryan princess to save from the woke mob. <laughs> hey, Doc. Let's move that appointment up to Monday. This has been the Internet Report. Thank you so much for watching and comment down below what you think I should report on next time. Remember, here on the Internet, nothing's real, nothing matters, and no one can be trusted. Goodbye.